In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is our fifth class of our Orthodox Survival Course, and we're still describing the orthodoxy that East and West shared in common in the first millennium, which we're calling the Church of the Romans. And our, tonight is our third topic in discussing this orthodoxy, and that is the topic of sacred art. And actually, I'm going to take two classes to talk about sacred art. Tonight, we're going to talk about the theory, and next week, we're going to look at examples. We're going to actually look at some of the, th some of the, uh, the artifacts and more that I talk about tonight. We'll, we'll actually examine, look at pictures next week and, and talk about it. Now, if the essences and orders above us, of which we have already made reverent mention, are without bodies, their hierarchy is intellectual and above sense. We supply by the variety of sensible symbols the visible order, which is according to our own measure. Those sensible symbols lead us naturally to intellectual conception, to God and his divine attributes. Spiritual minds form their own spiritual conceptions, but we are led to the divine vision by sensible images. This is St. Dionysius the Areopagite on the ecclesiastical hierarchy. St. John of Damascus quotes him in his defense of the icons and on the divine images. And we're going to come back to this because this, this statement by St. Dionysius, really it, it states the, the, the basis and the purpose of iconography. Another quote. Then we went on to Greece, and the Greeks led us to the edifices where they worshiped their god. And we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss how to describe it. We only know that God dwells there among men, and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations. For we cannot forget that beauty. The words of the emissaries of great prince Vladimir, St. Vladimir of Kiev, describing their visit to Constantinople in the 10th century from the primary chronicle, the Russian primary chronicle, the earliest large piece we have of Russian history, the largest uh, document we have of Russian history. Uh, the, of course, we, I think we all know this story, how uh, Vladimir was wondering which religion his people should adopt. Should they be Roman Catholic? are uh, Muslims, are, are Jews, are, are Orthodox Christians. And uh, they went to visit some mosque in Bulgaria, and they said, we didn't like it there. They said it was nasty and it smelled bad. <laughs> and then, uh, then they, they went to the services, they said, of the Germans, meaning the Roman Catholics or the Westerners. Mm -hmm. And they said, it was boring, they said. We saw no glory there. And then they went to Constantinople, and they went to the churches in Constantinople, including Hagia Sophia. And this is what they said. They were, they were amazed. Right? They were captured by the beauty that they saw there. And what's interesting is that they said specifically, for on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty. We, kn we know only that God dwells there among men. Okay, these are not theologians. These were, these were Viking warriors. And they were... You know what I read just today? No. In a catalog about, about how he chose a religion. Or the yes. You're going to laugh because they said he chose orthodoxy because out well, of many advantages, they, 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 could allowed, drink. they allowed the Russian people to continue drinking. Yes, that was, <laughs> that was a hard sell for the Muslims, right? No alcohol. Right. They're not, they're not the only people who like to drink. I'll leave that alone. Here's another quote. In its content as well as in its type, Ideational art articulates the major premise of ideational culture, that the true reality value is God. Therefore, the topic of ideational art is the supersensory kingdom of God. Its objective is not to amuse, entertain, or give pleasure, but to bring the believer into a closer union with God. It is a part of religion and functions as a religious service. It is a communion of the human soul with itself and with God. As such, it is sacred in content and form. As such, it does not admit any sensualism, eroticism, satire, comedy, caricature, farce, or anything extraneous to its nature. Its emotional tone is pious, ethereal, and ascetic. That's a quote from the great uh, sociologist, Petirum Sorokin, uh, The Crisis of Our Age, page 31. 
Now, I'll mention Patiram Sorokin later. We'll talk a little bit more about him. He's one of these uh, secular authors that, that can actually help us understand some of the things that we're talking about. We all know that orthodoxy is extremely beautiful in all of its artistic manifestations, visual art, architecture, literature, chant, liturgical movement, and so forth. Why is this so? It is because in all of history, the body of Orthodox Christian art comprises the highest and most faithful artistic manifestations of the highest unseen realities. Okay. Above all things, God himself. And then after God, the sacred hierarchy of the mother of God, the angels, and the saints. And this hierarchy continues then in the visible world in the hierarchy of the church on earth. And really the hierarchy uh, of all creation, of which the church is the, 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 the key to creation, right? The, the center, the heart, the sanctified uh, soul of creation. St. Dionysius the Areopagite, the disciple of St. Paul, explains in his treatise on the ecclesiastical hierarchies, which we quoted above, right? how our visible rituals and symbols are, symbols are anagogical. And this is a word we're going to use several times tonight. Anagogical. The Greek is ana, anagogi, which means literally leading up. Our visible rituals and symbols are anagogical. They lead us up. They lead our minds up to the invisible realities which are their prototypes. Right? Their prototypes are in heaven and their manifestations are on earth. Okay. Anagogical, by the way, comes from the Greek ana, which means up, and ago, which means to carry or to lead, as to lead a person or to lead an animal. If you're pulling an animal, it, it, if, if, it's a, if it's a rock or an inanimate thing, you say ferro, carry or bring. But if it's a person or an animal, you say ago, lead. Okay, so anag anagogi means leading up. So anagogical means pertaining to leading someone up, upwards. Now this naturally flows from what we've already discussed in our previous classes, right, in regards to orthodox spiritual life and orthodox theological language, which are human participations in the life of God himself. Right, by the power of the, of the uncreated energies, our prayer life and our theology, and as we're going to discuss tonight, our art, our liturgical, outward liturgical movement and so forth, are participations in the life of God himself. Okay. They're synergistic operations. Syner synergia means working together, right? Synergy is working together. So they're synergistic operations, uniting the created powers of our human organism, our body and soul, to the uncreated en energies of God. So orthodoxy is a completely integrated whole. All this fits together. Right? It's only natural that its art should manifest accurately <coughs> and beautifully its accurate and beautiful spiritual life and theological expression. You know, it's, there's an interesting story I have about this beauty. I was, uh, years ago, my children had a professor in college, and uh, he was a very active Roman Catholic, very zealous Roman Catholic, but he started studying about orthodoxy and he and I would have discussions. I'd go in, I'd go in to talk to him about my children's schoolwork, but then he would, we end up talking about the faith, of course. And uh, so finally he just told me he had decided to become Orthodox. Hmm. I said, well, that's great. I said, but I thought you had objections to A, B, and C. Uh, some theological things. He said, well, he said, I still have some questions. He said, but Orthodoxy is so beautiful. He said, I can't, he couldn't help it, in other words. He was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed by the beauty. I mean, his objections weren't absolute. I mean, he was a man of conscience. If his objections were absolute, he would not have become orthodox. Right? His objections, he still had questions, but, the, but what pushed him over the edge was this beauty. How could this not be the real faith? You see. In discussing the history of this art, let us recall the organic image of the growth of a tree, which we employed earlier to describe the church's maturation of her outward characteristics which reached their mature form by the ninth century. Remember, this is an important image that, um, I didn't make this up, I learned this. This is a, actually a well-known image um, that I've learned from other, uh, from Orthodox professors that they used to describe, you know, because people have this problem. They, they either say, well, the church must never change, nothing must ever change, or they say everything is all progress and change. And it's, not, it's neither nor, right? It's that the church 
the church's growth was like that of, a, uh, of it's analogous to that of an organic thing like a tree. There's a seed, and finally one day it becomes a full-grown tree. Then after that, it doesn't really change. It's outward manifestation. Okay? So it's outward manifestations matured and grew to a mature and perfect form, but essentially it was always the same organism. That tree always remained the same organism. Its DNA was always the same. See? And the church, is we could, that's an analogy for the church. Her, her DNA from the time of Christ and the apostles is exactly the same. It's exactly the same organism. But she, her outward manifestations naturally matured, right? and then they reached a point of perfection. Of course, critics would say it's a point of stagnation. They say orthodoxy is too static. It's stagnant. Of course, if anybody's been around orthodoxy, they know it's, not, it's anything but stagnant. Right? It's, it's very fruitful. It's very life-giving. It's very creative. Right? But, but, her, but the, base, the outlines or the basic structure of her mature form reached in, in the theology, architecture, art, uh, chant, and all these things, reached a very mature form by the ninth century. Really nothing has changed very much since then. We just have variations in all these themes. So whether you're an iconographer, whether you're a chanter, whether you're a, th a theological writer, whether you're a preacher, it's amazing how much it's, it's really the same. So much the same. Again, you can read a, a sermon by a father a thousand years ago, and it sounds like he's talking to us today. You see? Or it sounds like what the priest is saying on, on, on Sunday. Yeah, because the subject never changes. The subject doesn't change, yes. And even the forms remain remarkably the same, because those forms, one of our points, that when those forms reached a, a level of perfection that really can't be surpassed. Or, 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 as the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's like engineers. Yeah. It, it <laughs> she took the, so the church took the previously existing art of the Old Testament worship, and there was art in the Old Testament, despite what the iconoclasts say. The church took the existing art of the Old Testament worship and the art also of the Greco-Roman culture and transformed and synthesized them in an unsurpassed, indeed by its nature unsurpassable, breathtakingly magnificent, perfectly integrated ensemble Manifesting aesthetic virtue in the highest degree. And remember, there is such a thing as aesthetic virtue. People, are, people think that, there's, that the only kind of virtue is moral virtue, whether you're doing right or wrong right, in the moral sphere, right? uh, in your social or familial life. Right? But there's also intellectual virtue and aesthetic virtue, and intellectual vice and aesthetic vice. It's not, it's not morally... Um, indifferent whether someone speaks the truth or not, or uses an honest intellectual method or not. It is not morally indifferent if someone produces art that leads one to God or art that leads you away from God. Right? So there's such a thing as aesthetic virtue. Uh, so much of, or the vast majority of modern art in all its manifestations manifests uh, an almost uh, unbelievable aesthetic vice. Right? The fragmentation, the, the disorientation, the vulgarity, the, the stupidity of modern art, right, is, is vicious, right? It, 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 it hurts people, okay? It's so... Pur it's purposely stupid. Well, of course, the purpose is, <laughs> the purpose is whether by demons or by men, the purpose is, is vicious, right? So when I say aesthetic virtue, that's a very serious term. The, the orthodox art is, exhibits aesthetic virtue, right, in the highest degree. In every type of art, but especially the visual and the auditory and the architectonic, right? Visual, auditory, auditory, both hearing and speech, right? So the, the higher senses are our sight and our hearing and speech, right? The tactile sense and the olfactory sense are, are also created by God. They're also good, but damaged by sin, of course, but good. But they're lower in the hierarchy, right? The highest is the speech, hearing, and... and uh, uh, and uh, vision, of course, the vision being the highest. See, <clears throat> both in their public and domestic forms, okay, and those dedicated both to official ceremony and to daily life. Okay. So these artistic forms uh, spread to every aspect of the life of a, of the completely developed Orthodox societies. Right, it affected people's. Clothing, the, 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 how they adapted the patterns of their ancestral clothing to their new Christian faith. How they adapted their, the, their ancestral patterns of domestic architecture. Of, and of course, obviously, cuisine. 
their, their cooking and so forth. Uh, every, every aspect, both of the arts and the, what can be arts and crafts, even in domestic life, in civic life, were influenced by the church to a very great extent. And, but of course, the center was the actual liturgical life of the church and the prayer life of the church. Okay. In our classes tonight and next week, we cannot possibly cover the entire history of Orthodox sacred art. Remember, everything about this course is very ambitious. We're covering, a, we're painting with a very broad stroke. We have to, necessarily, right? But our purpose is to give a brief historical overview and to summarize the character of genuine sacred art and relate this to our previous insights of the characteristics of the church and her spiritual life and her theology. So the history of our, of our art. Okay. So the New Testament church had simultaneously to preserve the teaching of the incomprehensibility of God. God cannot be contained by human mind or human art or any human effort. Right? Against the temptation of idolatry. So the, the idolatry of the pagans, the idolatry of the nations. Right? But preserving against Manichaeism and other dualisms the teaching of the inherent goodness of creation and its instrumentality in lifting man, remember that anagogi, lifting, in lifting man from knowledge of the creation to knowledge of the creator. Okay? So you have the pagans who are worshiping rocks and, and sticks and stones and so forth, right? and, or alligators or cows or whatever. And then you have, on the other hand, you have these, this, this sect in the, in the early church. There was a very big attack on the church by the sect of the Manichees. St. Augustine, for example, grew up a Manichee before he converted to Orthodoxy. Um, then, well, didn't grow up a Manichee, but became a Manichee in his, in his, when he was a teenager. And the Manichees taught that matter is inherently evil. And there are many, they're not the only ones, there are many dualistic sects, but dualistic, a radical dualism between matter and spirit. So that matter is evil, your body is evil, uh, marriage is evil, having children is evil, because it's all matter. And when you have children, that's making more matter, so that's evil. You see? And uh, so they had this radical teaching of matter being evil. And this is where, this is the direction that all iconoclasm goes towards. It's toward this idea that matter is evil, it has nothing to do with it. Right? I was explaining, I was talking to a Protestant friend uh, the other day, and he was agreeing with me that so much of modern Protestant thought is really not based on the Bible. Their, their, their suspicion of icons, their suspicion of the sacraments, of, of uh, incense, of the vestments, and so forth, is not based on the Bible. The Bible is full of those things. It's based on the modern Western Cartesian dichotomy between mind and body, or between flesh and spirit. Cartesian, going back to Rene Descartes, the French philosopher who said, I, I think, therefore I am, and that man is a ghost in a machine. All that matters is your brain, or your mind, not the brain, your soul, your mind, the invisible part of you. The, the, visible, the visible stuff is, is, is irrelevant. There's a radical dichotomy. See? So much of modern Western Christian thought, and therefore for our, to help us understand Amer American culture, or the Western European culture has become the dominant culture. It's the culture we live in. Right? As uh, Louis Boyer, the Catholic um, writer in the 1950s said, we can't say, uh, we, uh, none of us can say completely that we're not Americans, because this so-called American culture has been spread everywhere, right? So to understand this modern culture, we have to understand that so much is based on this thought of Descartes, that there's this radical split between body and soul, between, between matter and spirit. Now the Manichees are an early uh, heresy, or really beyond a heresy, just a sect or a cult, uh, in the years of the early church, and the church had to fight this idea. The church said, no, matter, God, what is it, what is St. Genesis? And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was very good. And he blessed it, right? And so the, the whole mysteriological system of the church, our sacraments and also the icons, the blessing of water, uh, kissing the hand of the priest, the sign of the cross, these are all ways that matter is sanctified and then it sanctifies us and lifts us up to divine things. So the church... And, and, and this, this goodness of creation is underscored and completed and made fully possible by what? The incarnation. God became part of the created world. So just as the church took the Old Testament faith to the Gentiles and gave birth to the new Israel of the New Testament, that's us, we're Israel, we're the New Testament church. So the church took the highest aspects of the externals of the Old Testament worship and united them to the highest aspects of the art of the ancient world, the non-Jewish world. 
Okay, just as she baptized the Gentiles with, with the faith of the scriptures, right? She baptized the art of our ancestors. Right? They, all of our ancestors had these ancestral traditions of art. Right? And as, a, as the church came to our ancestors and baptized them, then she baptized aspects of, all aspects of their life, including the art. Now, primarily, we're going to be talking about the Greco-Roman art because that's the dominant type of art, especially for us, for our purposes. Okay? There, there were, in the East, there, there were influences from the Oriental nations, especially Persia. Uh, for example, even today, you can hear Persian um, influence in Georgian and Armenian chant, uh, for example. Okay? But that's not, we can't get off onto those footnotes and those, those side issues, right? The main thing is the Greco-Roman art here. So she united them to the highest aspects of the art of the ancient world, to give birth to, uh, to the externals of the worship of this new Israel. Okay? What we call orthodox art can only be understood entirely within the framework of orthodox worship and life of prayer and theology. So whenever somebody comes to you and says, oh, well, you're orthodox, I love your icons. You say, well, you'll love our faith even more. Okay? You'll love our theology. Come, you know, the, the icons are inviting you. Right? It's all one, tell them it's all one. It's, it's, it's all a whole. If you love the icons, that means God is telling you something, right? He's drawing you. I remember um, I have another story of another conversion. I had a, a friend, uh, they were my prisoners in Denver, but they had converted and come to the Russian church in Denver before I was the priest there. Um, they were old veterans, and they'd been Orthodox since the 70s. And, uh, they, um, and one of the ladies was an artist. Uh, she's still an artist. She's, she actually illustrated the first edition of a children's prayer book that we produced years ago in Denver. And um, her friend, her friend, uh, she wasn't Orthodox yet, and she'd never been in an Orthodox church. And her friend uh, took her, says, come to my church, come to my church. And said, no, no, I don't want to go to that church. And she walked into the church, and she was just silent for two hours, three hours of the service. And it was all in church Slavonic. She didn't understand the words. She was just standing there, just smitten. Then her friend took her out. And the friend said, well, what do you think? And she said, you didn't tell me it was going to be like that. You didn't tell me it was going to be like that. She said, I have to become Orthodox. She said, the icons, of course, she was kind of, this, this sounds kind of sentimental or kind of funny, but she said, the icons are speaking to me, is what she said. So she had to become Orthodox. So um, it's all integrated. So, so we, what, we, what we call this Orthodox art can be understood only within the framework of the worship the life of prayer and the theology. It's all, it's a whole. As uh, to use the slang, it's a package deal. <clears throat> the worship of the Old Testament. It's obvious that the early church saw her worship as a continuation and fulfillment of the worship of the Old Testament. It's a seamless whole. Right? Right. Okay. The Old Testament religion is not Judaism. The Old Testament religion is simply the Old Testament version of Orthodox Christianity. The Orthodox faith is the faith of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it's a seamless whole. The, the apostles and early, early Christians continued the, the worship of the temple and the synagogue, but adjusted to the new revelation of Christ. Right? So she preserved and elevated this worship in its chant, the, for the use of the Psalms of David preeminently, the symbolism of the priestly service, the garments, the movements, the rituals, and the symbolism of the visual arts and the architecture. If you read St. John of Damascus or St. Theodore Studite about the icons, they're constantly referring to the Old Testament. See, constantly referring to the Old Testament. The Holy Fathers constantly recur to the instructions given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai regarding the worship of Israel and to the description of the Temple of Solomon in the Book of Kings when discussing both the inner life of the soul right, as well as the outward worship of the church, the two manifestations of the one reality of this anagogical movement of man towards God. So there's the outward worship of the church then there's the inward life of the soul that we talked about two weeks ago. Right? And the Holy Fathers use the images from God's instructions to Moses on Mount Sinai that, that are primarily in, in Exodus and Leviticus about the temple worship. And they use the, the imagery of the temple and, and, uh, and the worship of the temple as the image of the life of the soul and also to, as uh, an, uh, images of the New Testament worship. So in Christianizing the Old Testament worship, 
the apostles and fathers led this worship up from being a typos, a type of foreshadowing of the true worship, into being the true worship. Okay? So the worship in the Old Testament that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, and really the worship even before Moses, the worship of the patriarchs, their sacrifices, their prayers. This worship goes all the way back to the Garden of Paradise, right? Cain and Abel offered sacrifice. But it was, especially we see it systematized, so to speak, in the instructions God gives Moses on Mount Sinai. Okay. So, but this was a foreshadowing. It was a, the Greek word is typos, a word we've discussed before. A typos or a type is a person or a thing or an event in the Old Testament that is real. It's a historical reality. It really happened or it really existed. But it's also an image or a symbol or a foreshadowing, a prophetic looking forward to the fulfillment of that thing in the New Testament. Okay. So the, the, the worship that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai is a foreshadowing of the worship of the New Testament. The worship in spirit and in truth that the Lord speaks of to the Samaritan woman in John 4.23, the gospel we read on the, the fifth Sunday of Lent, the uh, fifth Sunday, excuse me, not of Lent, of Pascha, the fifth Sunday of Pascha, the Samaritan woman. The Lord says, the woman says, uh, St. Saint, Fotini Saint says, well, you Jews say you should worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans say we should worship here in Mount Gerizim. And he says, I tell you solemnly, the, the time will come when they worship neither in Jerusalem nor in Mount Gerizim, but the true worshipers of, the Lord, of God worship in spirit and in truth. So this orthodox worship is the worship in spirit and in truth. Okay. One example of this was, uh, one example of spiritualizing the Old Testament worship was, for example, eliminating instrumental music. Okay. We know from the Old Testament that they played horns, they had cymbals. Even in the Psalms, it still says cymbal and dance, strings and flute. Okay. These, but, uh, but in the New Testament church, these things were gradually eliminated because they did not serve the purpose of lifting the soul up to the highest things. They were all right, right? But they were too prone to exciting the emotions or the, the lower faculties of the soul. And, and the, the Holy Spirit led the church to gradually eliminate these things. Now, they, they're not eliminated in the Coptic or the Ethiopian church, but that's another question. Because they've been separated from the church for 1,600 years. So that's, they're not an example right, to follow. And I don't really know the story of whether it was never gotten rid of or whether they reintroduced it after they fell away from orthodoxy, but that's another question. But in the Orthodox Church, they limited instrumental music, and in the West, they only reintroduced it when? After the schism. So that tells you something. See. So the first thousand years? Before. No, they never had it. No, they never had it. Now, there was an organ. Uh, the Byzantines you know, had, had the organ. The organ is not a modern invention. It goes back to, to the first millennium. Uh, the, in Constantinople, they had organs, but there was an organ in the, but it, the organ was mainly used for secular events. For example, there was an organ in the Hippodrome to, you know, to get the crowd cheering and so forth for the chariot races. And there was an organ in Hagia Sophia, but it was only used to accompany processions of the imperial court into the church, a specifically civic or political or governmental <coughs> action, see, a secular uh, moment, so to speak. Part the Not church. part of the service, no, never part of the service. That's right. Um, and, and the organ was not, the instrumental music was not used in the West until after the schism. Until after, it's very clear, until after the schism. Yeah. And the stricter monastic orders in the West never introduced it. Uh, for example, uh, Carthusian monasteries, which are like the strictest hermit order, they've un unbrokenly, they've never used, they've never had an organ. You see, they, they know it was not from the not, just as in those monastic churches, they don't have pews. They just have the stasidia, the like we have in the, in the Greek church, the the um, the, the choir the choir stalls. Yeah. <clears throat> Another example was changing the basis of the selection of the priests. Okay, in the Old Testament, it depended on your family. If you were a tribe of Levi, you were a priest. It's strictly on descent. But in the New Testament church, at least according to the canons, it's supposed to be spiritual fitness a certain level of moral and spiritual preparation to be a priest. You're a, you're a baptized man, you're morally and spiritually fit, so regardless of whether you're uh, uh, Jones or Ivanov or whatever, whatever your name is, whatever, whoever your father was, you can, become, you can become a priest. Now, of course, in the history of the Orthodox Church, as a matter of 
social development. Often there are developed priestly families. But ideally, if there was a priestly family, it's because the fathers would pass on to their sons the real training, the real spiritual, moral, intellectual training to be priests. It wasn't simply because, well, my father's a priest, so I get to be a priest, or it shouldn't be that way. But it should be, well, uh, I, I know a young priest, there's a young priest here in the Detroit area where they, they've been priests, they've been priests for 25 generations, unbroken, see. But um, that's, only, that's only worthy, right, that's only good if, if the fathers are actually teaching their sons, right, and making them truly worthy to be priests. But uh, in the, there are no canons. The canons speak only of spiritual fitness, not of physical descent, unlike the Old Testament. That's another way, that's just another example of how the church spiritualized the worship of the Old Testament. What about the celibacy of the priest? When, did, when was that introduced in the, in the Western world? Celibacy is a very great topic. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a complex topic because the, yeah, thank you, in the, in the Western church, even going very early on, there was always a push, uh, there was always a push in the Western church, even in their Orthodox years, for centuries, to, in, to, in, to have only celibate clergy. And there was always the push back from the Eastern church to, allow, to, to keep ordaining married men. But that's, and the, the break was not final until the Council in Trullo, which was, the Council in Trullo was one of the moments that led up to the schism. Council in Trullo was at the end of the, at the end of the 8th century, the late 700s. They had, the, they'd had this, uh, no, no, excuse me, Council Trullo is at the end of the, Council Trullo is the 5th and 6th. So the Council Trullo is at the end of the 7th century in the 690s. And the 5th and 6th ecumenical councils issued dogmas, but no canons. Dogmatic pronouncements, but no, no, no administrative or disciplinary canons. So they had a kind of a housekeeping council. They called it intrulo because the trulo means dome in Greek, and there was a big uh, palace. The trulo palace had a big dome. It's also called in Western scholars they call it the quinisex, meaning the council of the fifth and the sixth, because it was it was issuing canons for the fifth and the sixth, and and the fifth and the sixth definitively. Uh, stated that not only may priests, not only may we ordain married men, but that the priests may go on living with their wives and begetting children after ordination. Until then, it was not clear, even in the East, if the priests should go on um, uh, being uh, physically husbands after ordination. That was not clear. See, and then in the East, they finally said yes. The priests, of course, the priests have to follow the same discipline everyone follows for going to Holy Communion. So the priest serves frequently. That aspect of their marital life is is tightly is highly controlled, right? But still, the, the priest was allowed. And and a paradox, or interestingly, priests are often examples of having large families. They're often a good example to their flock because they have they have a lot of children. They have large families. Um, whereas in the West, the West grumbled about this decision. A, a saint, Saint Bede, who is a, a genuine, who is an Orthodox saint, but a, a real Westerner, he said. He rejected the Quinisex Council. He says that's a, that's terrible. They shouldn't they shouldn't do that. See, because in, in the West they, they always had this um, push to 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 ma make it set mandatory, but it was not universally mandatory. It was not mandated by Rome until the year one thousand, around the year one thousand. So it was a long process, um, and even even after Rome mandated it, in scattered areas of the Western. Um, Empire, the Western Christendom, there was still married clergy. There's there's a wonderful uh, if, for those who love literature and who who want to read uplifting literature as opposed to reading junk. There's a, a Norwegian author named uh, Sigrid Unset. She's a wonderful. She wrote beautiful books, and she, her her magnum opus, at least in the eyes of critics, is a book a trilogy called Christian Lafren's Daughter, and she wrote a tetralogy tetralogy called the Master of Hestviken. And there, she, she researched, she's someone who converted from Lutheranism to Catholicism uh, in, in Lutheran Norway in the early 20th century because she, in her researches of the Middle Ages, she fell in love with the medieval church. Of course, she didn't go all the way and become Orthodox, but she did go and become Catholic. She was the first one to get the Nobel Prize, right? Correct. The uh, first woman. Ever. The first woman ever to get the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you know about Sigrun Unset. Yeah. Bravo. Um, yes, and... Um, her family is also active in the independence movement of Norway when it became independent from Sweden, but that's another story. Um, she also traveled in the United States and met various famous people in the United States in the 1930s.
But in in Sigurd, Unz, in Sigurd Unset's works, she 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 researched the life of the medieval Norwegians very meticulously, and she discovered that they had married priests. So one of the characters in 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 Kristen Lovren's daughter is a married priest, whose son actually is bad and he does bad things, and it's part of the plot. But it's just interesting. She also notes in in Kristen Lovren's daughter that they fasted from dairy products, which the Westerners have not done now for some time. And also that they fasted from marital relations during Lent. Because it shows the men, it shows they're in a big manner, in a medieval manner, and it shows it's, it's Lent, and so the men are going off to sleep in a, in a different, separate building from the women, you see. These are all things that have disappeared from the Western church. But she researched all this, and she, she was honest and meticulous in, in, in delineating this medieval nor life in Norway in the, in the 14th century. It's very interesting. So anyway, that's a kind of a long answer to your question. Um, so getting back to the art, um, let's talk about now, we've talked about the Old Testament and the Hebrew worship. Let's talk about the Greco-Roman art. We must keep in mind that what we call Greco-Roman civilization was already extremely old at the time of the New Testament. It's a very old civilization. And, and it, its arts were also old, and they had undergone many phases and many changes. But we, we can safely characterize the art of the late ancient world. The, the, by late ancient, we mean the, the, the period when the, church, the New Testament church came into being. Right? As highly developed sensate art. Okay, what's sensate art? Art that emphasizes this worldly realities. Right? It emphasizes the senses and this worldly realities. But it's, it's very beautiful. It's technically brilliant, okay? but it's emphasizing this worldly things. Okay? There's great emphasis on sculpture, for example, magnificent sculpture, right? um, whose three-dimensional character is necessarily opaque and sensual. Opaque means you can't see through it. Right? Opaque, you can, you can say something's opaque literally. For example, that wall is opaque, I can't see through it. But you can also use opaque in a figurative sense. For example, you can say, well, that, that man's character is very opaque. I can't read him. I don't understand him. I can't get through to the inside of him. It's opaque. Or this, this writing is so opaque, like the author is not revealing what he really means. Okay. So, we, it's, so sculpture is opaque in that sense. Right? Now, someone could say that an icon is literally opaque. Well, you can't literally see through it to the parking lot. Right? But spiritually, the icon is very transparent. Right? It's revelatory of... A, a reality beyond itself. It's inviting you to this reality beyond itself. It's, it's, it's mediating that reality. Okay. So, so sculpture is very opaque. It's very sensual, right? It's, it's very tactile. Right? It conveys, it, it can convey ideas and feelings of something noble. If you look at some of the ancient Greek sculpture, you're, it's breathtaking or it's overwhelming, right? It, convey, it can convey an, a feeling of something noble, but because it lacks transparency, because it calls attention to itself, right? It cannot anagogically lead the mind to the direct experience of that which is above the material. Okay? It can lead you to admire something or to be inspired by something that you're not connected to. But, the, but a, a transparent form of art, and, and we know that in the church eventually they, they uh, almost exclusively use two-dimensional iconography, right? two-dimensional art, not, not sculpture. Because of the transparency of the medium, it, it actually mediates the reality. It doesn't just inspire you or remind you of the reality. The two dimensions God. It's actually, it's, you're going through that dimension to God, yes. Yeah, it's a window. Yeah, it's a window, exactly. Windows of the soul, right? Windows to heaven. Okay, the eyes are the windows of the soul. Icon is window to heaven. Plus, they also they say about the statues because they are finite. You can go around it. You can go around it, that's right, that's right. There's, there's, there's no aspect of eternity. There's the icon, you can't, you can't, you, you don't, you never get around it. Yes. It's a window to eternity. Yes. That's a very good, I'm going to add that to my notes. That's, that's a very good, uh, well, it's not mine. no, I, well, none of this is mine either. I mean, we're, we're all, sh we're all sharing, we're all, we're, we're building this together. Um, <clears throat> um, the architecture and use of the temple, the, the pagan temple, is another example of this opacity. And we're going to look at examples of pagan temples next week. Um, of course, there's the famous Parthenon, uh, on the, which everybody knows about, in the Acropolis. So the Parthenon actually, as a little footnote, the Parthenon was a Christian church much longer than it was a pagan temple. It was converted to a church of the Holy Virgin. Uh, Parthenos means virgin, right, in Greek. 
The, it was called the, the Parthenon because it was dedicated to the virgin goddess Athena, the, the patroness of Athens. But the church, it was converted early on by the church in the early centuries to a church dedicated to the Holy Virgin and only ceased being a church when the Turks took over. And it was made for a while into a mosque and then, then the Turks are using it for an ammunition dump and the British or Russians or somebody blew it up. And um, that's why it's in the, the it's, it's a fragmented state now. But really, it should be returned to the church. It should be a church. Okay, but that's, another, that's another subject. But, um, but the, the temples, the pagan temples were magnificent, but they were intended as backdrops for public ceremonies outside. Okay, most of the great religious ceremonies of the pagan world were, were, were public civic spectacles of games, of sacrifices, of... of, of um, the elections of, of the magistrates, all these things, all these were religious ceremonies that took place with the temple as a backdrop. If you went inside the temple, it was very dim and dark, and there was just a s very small naos or, or, or um, sanctuary where, where, you'd go, where the statue of the god was. And the priest would, might bring in a, a sacrifice, you know, kill an animal and bring a sacrifice in there. But uh, n very little took place, very little took place, and very few people went inside these temples. Uh, if you travel to France, there's a completely intact Roman temple. The French call it the Maison Carré. It's in Nîmes in southern France. It's, it's, a, it's a very important because it's a completely intact Roman, Roman temple. I think it's dedicated to Jupiter. And, but it's beautiful on the outside. You go on the inside, there's hardly anything on the inside. Right? It's very cramped on the inside because nothing, hap nothing much happened there. It was really sort of it just housed the statue of the god. Okay. So the, the characteristic of the pagan temples are an exterior magnificence, okay? and this exterior exteriority was completely appropriate to a culture in which religion was primarily a civic cult. It didn't matter what you really believed, what mattered was that you participated because this civic cult was the glue that held the society together. That's why they wanted the Christians to sacrifice the genius of Caesar, to be patriotic. They didn't care. They say, believe whatever you want. We don't care if you really believe in Caesar. Uh, you know, uh, you know, privately they might say, well, I don't, I don't believe that Caligula is a god either. You know, how could you? Or Nero or whoever. But you must sacrifice the genius of Caesar to show your loyalty to the, to the, to the imperium, to the res publica, right, to the state, right? And so this exteri the exteriority of, the, of this magnificent sensate art was appropriate to this mindset of, of what this religion really uh, was for. So then, then the church baptized this art and architecture. Now the visual art of the early church, that church of the catacombs we talked about a few weeks ago, was for the most part either purely abstract and symbolic, or it, it consisted of very ch childlike scriptural imagery. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at pictures next week of um, the catacomb paintings. Uh, if you go to Rome, if you ever go to Rome, make sure you get, go and see the catacombs. There are miles and miles of them. And, uh, and you see some of the most important examples of the very earliest Christian art uh, in the catacombs under Rome. They have something interesting there. They have coffins, mm -hmm. and uh, they have a hole in the coffin. And they ask them why they have a hole. They said there were pagans who were first generations of Christians. So mm -hmm. They buried their relatives. Mm -hmm. They still thought that they had to bring them food. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one possibility. No, that's what the that's what the, said that's what the docent said. Was uh, was uh, something which remained from the. It's quite possible because there are always in all of our Orthodox cultures there are substrata of pagan practices or beliefs. It's yeah. Um, and also, there is uh, there is highly there were, there was symbolism like the key rho, the 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 letters he rho in Greek Christos. <coughs> so remember, Christianity was against the law. So some, they'd use these symbols as kind of a code. Or the fish, the, the famous fish anagram, Jesus Christos Theo Ios Sotir, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. The first letters made the Greek word, for, the ancient Greek word for fish. Today we say psari, but in ancient Greek it's ichthys. And uh, so they just draw a fish and that would to symbolize Christ. And also they'd, they'd paint simple pictures of scriptural uh, events like the, the three young men in the fiery furnace, uh, the mystical supper. Um, uh, the, we'll look at some of these images next week. 
And the, the, the most uh, famous extant examples are the simple art of the catacombs in Rome and the art at the house church at Dura Europos in Syria. We're going to look at pictures of that next week too. Actually, you can see it. You don't have to go to Syria. The, the archaeologists and art, art restorers and so forth, an expert team, took apart the whole thing and it's at Yale University. I'd like to, I myself would like to go to, it's, well, Yale University of Princeton, it's one of the Ivy League universities. They have this entire house church reproduced. The, the actual art, they, they carefully took it off the walls and took the artifacts. And, they, and it's a good thing because last year ISIS blew the whole village up. So it's, we can actually go see this. So uh, it's a house church, and Dura Europus was a Roman colony, so this wasn't, a, this wasn't Syrian art, this was actually uh, West Roman or Latin art. Um, there are, by contrast, a few examples of Christian-themed late antique sculpture. There are some ancient Christian sculptures. Because right? remember, they're coming out of the Greco-Roman culture, and they're, they're employing the media that they have at hand. So we have either something very simple and undeveloped on the one hand, that's most of it, or a few examples of this sophisticated late antique technique of sculpture. And there, there are a few, there's, a, there's a famous sculpture of the Good Shepherd, for example, which is almost certainly a Christian artifact. But there, there aren't many examples of this. Okay. Now in architecture, that's a, there's a real change in architecture. In regards to church architecture, we must remember that the church first gathered for the liturgy in people's homes. St. Paul says, the church that is in the house of Stephanos salutes you. The church in so-and-so's house. The church in so-and-so's house. Why? Because they would originally, we look in the Acts of the Apostles, the apostles would go to the temple. They kept going to the temple for the, the psalm singing, for the, the morning and evening sacrifice of the burning of incense and the psalms. But then they would break bread, that is, perform the, the, the liturgy of the faithful, the Eucharist, in homes. Of course, very early on, they were kicked out of the temple and kicked out of the synagogue. So they did both parts in the home, in the house church. So the earliest term known for a place of worship is not a church, but o ikos tis ecclesias, or domus ecclesiae, the house of the church. The building, we're the church, right? the people are the church, the gathered assembly, and the, the building is the house of the church. The first stage after the house church was, in Latin, the word was titulus, meaning you had the title, you had a deed to a building. A house purchased by a local church and dedicated completely for the parish. Like this, the parish house, and it, it was strictly for the use of the parish, and it contained the church and also a place for the bishop or the priest and a place for alms, where they collected alms. Now, this domestic character of the place of worship was to endure throughout the church's history. It is one of the enduring and distinguishing characteristics of good church architecture. It still is. No matter how grand or how large a church is, the best examples retain an interior and familial quality, a domestic quality. You feel at home there. It doesn't crush you with this magnificence. It may be magnificent, and at same, simultaneously it feels warm. You feel at home. It, a, a good, good, good church architecture never creates something that's purely an official or monumental structure. A church building is not a monument to God. It's a place where people come to be saved, to be sanctified, where they gather as a church family. So the purpose of the church is to gather people together for communal familial worship and to, also to encourage the interior worship of the heart. The interior worship of the heart. The genius of great Orthodox church architecture is that it can produce a very large building that is also warm, familial, and inviting. It does not crush the worshiper with its weight or grandeur. Now, of course, there are examples of officially Orthodox churches that unfortunately do crush you. For example, the, uh, the great Italianate churches in St. Petersburg, you want to St. Isaac's or the Kazanskia uh, church in St. Petersburg. It's very grand. It's very magnificent but you feel crushed by the weight of this vast Italian Baroque structure that's so foreign to the spirit of Orthodox worship. I'm not saying it's not a real church. I'm not saying I wouldn't worship there. You know, if I was assigned as a priest, you know, I'd serve there and so forth. But, but um, it's, 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 not, or it's, it, it's an Italian church with Orthodox icons stuck on it, or even, even the iconography is really not, in that particular church, is not that Orthodox. Why is it Italian in St. Petersburg? 
because um, the 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 uh, Peter the Great and the the Tsars after him in the 18th century brought in Western architects, as in they brought in Western everything, right? So they brought in Western architects to to uh, build because they wanted to they wanted to show the Italians and the French and the Germans so they could have big massive uh, imposing churches just like the uh, just like the Westerners could, right? Um, <clears throat> So, um, but real church architecture, so, but if you go, you can go to a vast, I've never been in Hagia Sophia, but everyone who's been there says the same thing, that it's, you've been there. So it's vast, and yet it doesn't crush you, it lifts you up, you feel like. It's interesting because, you know, uh, they still keep the old icons from the Byzantines. They have. Although they still have their old, their Muslim, whatever. Those big, uh, shields and those whatever big, they yeah. The, it's, but it's. They they still have on the on the on the walls. There are icons. The icons. They've exposed some of them. Actually, what happened was they were covered. it was made into they a yeah. It was made into a mosque. For centuries, they were all covered over. But remember, under Ataturk, Turkey, strictly speaking, is a secular Ataturk, state. Yeah. So they they made it into a museum, and they uncovered. They brought in uh, teams of Western um, curators and restorers to uncover those icons, in its in its capacity as a museum. Yeah, it's it's vast. It's yes, it's vast. You look and you're like, yeah. But it's only a part of what you see because underneath there is there are other yes. levels which yes. are flooded and uh, yeah. Yeah. Nobody yeah. knows exactly. Yeah, it's 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 very vast. Yes, it's very vast. Um, so they're flooded. Yeah. Underneath. Yeah. Underneath. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go on and talk about, we're kind of trying to cover all these different aspects of art. So let's talk about literature and music. The Greek and Roman literature, especially the Greek, right, produced language that was extraordinarily powerful, supple and precise. Remember, language is um, higher, it's, it's closer to our highest function, right, to our noetic function. And, and the Greek language, even though it had been used for non-Christian or secular purposes for so long, it had become a very very powerful intellectual tool, very powerful artistic tool for expressing truth and beauty. Though its content, uh, though its content not being the direct revelation of God, of course not, I mean, uh, the great philosophers, Plato and Socrates, or the, the dramatists, Aeschylus and so forth, or Homer, are not, not, that's not divine revelation, right? So it cannot rise to the level of Holy Scripture, but its form, the language, the, la the, the tools of the language, the form of the language, being words was not as opaque as pagan sculpture of pe temple architecture. It lent itself quite easily to the use of the apostles and the fathers. What language is the New Testament written in? It's in Greek. So the, the Greek language is baptized immediately by the apostles themselves, who wrote the, the, wrote the, the words of Jesus Christ in Greek. Okay. This is probably true of the music as well, but it's very difficult to ascertain exactly what the music sounded like. There were no recordings. <clears throat> we don't really know exactly what the music of the Old Testament sounded like. The consensus is that Christian chant was a synthesis of the two. It took the content of the Old Testament church's chant, the chant of the temple and the synagogue, right? but it took the theory that the Greeks had developed about the eight tones and the notation of the Greek uh, musical uh, tradition to systematize the chant of the, of the Old Testament. That, that, and this became the chant of the New Testament church. And if, if people ask you, what did the chant in Bible sound, sounded like? So the closest thing we have is Byzantine chant. The, closest thing. the, the organic continuation of the chant of the time of the scriptures is the traditional chant. In the West, it came to be called Gregorian chant. Um, in the East, it came to be called, today we call it Byzantine chant. Although remember, Byzantine itself is a modern term. But the two are simply the respective Eastern and Western developments of the original chant of the early church. And what, what are the characteristics of this chant? It's monodic. There's one voice. It's not harmonized. It's monodic. It emphasizes the words, the language. It's, made to, it's, it's, it's always around a sacred text to emphasize, to bring out the beauty, the meaning of a sacred text. Uh, authentic chant is very calm. It's very, it's very, it's serene. It's made to calm the person so that they can really pray and their mind ascends to higher realities. And, so, and, and, it, and it doesn't use instruments. It does not, it's, it's the, the instrument of the voice. 
the instrument created by God himself, which is the human voice. Okay, so the baptism of this inherited linguistic and musical art during this period we're studying is less radical and less obvious than the visual arts. And it's also harder to explain. So for our purposes, we're going to um, simply talk about the visual arts and the architecture. Okay, so there was a transformation. In the realm of the visual arts, instead of, instead of sculpture, they went to late antique portrait painting as a, a basis for Christian art. And there, there's a famous collection of paintings that were discovered in Egypt, a place called Fayum, which are portraits that were placed on mummy cases. And this is, this is, not, this is not ancient old Egypt, this is Greek Egypt or Ptolemaic Egypt. So the, these, are painting, these are paintings from the late antique period, the time after Christ. And they're, they're wonderful, beautiful paintings. By young man, right? Young, young well, person. Well, I mean, the picture. The, Read the pictures. Yeah, the, the, there's a famous one of the young man. There are actually, I think there's over 100 of them. Exactly. And there's a whole fam there are whole families. Leonidas is... Uh, yeah, his, his little symbol on symbol Facebook is one of those, one of those, right? those Fayum paintings. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so these are... Uh, the Fayum paintings are very instructive because they're an example of late antique secular art. But you can already see the serenity... Mm and the formalism and the, the interiority, the beauty of iconography in this art. Right. And, uh, and, and, and this style of art was really, was easily transmuted into the iconographic style. So the, the famous icon of our Lord from Mount Sinai, the, the famous Sinai Christ, I think we're most familiar. If you see it, you know what I'm talking about. We'll, talk, we'll look at it like next week. Is, is not far removed from this school of art. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll talk about that. Of course, the Christians also developed mosaic to a very high degree. We'll also, we'll also talk about that, the use of mosaic. Mosaic is very well suited to sacred art because what? It emphasizes light. And uh, the whole, the, whole the, 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 the actual the use of light is just extraordinary. And um, because God is light, right? Our experience of God is the experience of the uncreated light. And mosaic emphasizes this aspect of light. Uh, to a very great degree. Plus, it's indestructible. Yes, mosaic is tough. Um, you can go see. I've. I really want to go and see the mosaics in Ravenna. I've never been to Ravenna, but I, I have seen the great mosaic, apse mosaic in Mount Sinai, from the same era, from the sixth century. Both the churches in Ravenna in northeastern Italy and the church in Mount Sinai are built during the reign of Justinian by the direct under the direct patronage of Justinian. And uh, so that, that, that mosaic is still there, and it's brilliant. So the children should learn mosaic. And to do mosaic, yes, it'd be a very good thing for children. I agree, that'd be a good class for us to have. Um, in the realm of architecture, when the church was free to build large public buildings for her worship, she did not choose the pagan temple. She chose the basilica. Basilica is from uh, in Greek, uh, uh, basiliki, or, uh, which means... Um, or basilica, which means a kingly building. Vasilevs is the king. So it meant a government building, actually, a, a civic building. The basilicas were large rectangular buildings, which were large open space on the inside with a raised dais at the far end where the magistrate sat when he was hearing cases or when the, the city council would sit when they're, they're holding meetings and so forth. And whole crowds of people could crowd in because remember these are the, the whole... Hellenistic and Roman world were, was a, a network of city-states where, where citizens would come in and take part in the civic life uh, of the city and they'd come into the basilica and uh, press lawsuits or do business or uh, make a petition before a judge or have an audience with the local magistrate or, or with the emperor for that matter. Okay. So the church chose the basilica. Why? Because the basilica has a huge space on the inside for people to gather. And the raised dais at the end, where the magistrate sat, became the altar. Right? And the rail or screen separating the magistrate from the body of the basilica became the, the iconostasion, or the templon. See? So it was easily transformed into a Christian place of worship. So the, the, because the worship of the church consists of a gathering, our word, ecclesia, now, the Romanian word, biserica, is from this word, basilica. The Greek word and the Latin word is ecclesia, or ecclesia in Latin, is from the Hebrew, kahal, 
which means the congregation, the gathering of the people. Okay. And this is the word when the when uh, this is the word that is used in the New Testament for who we are. The church is is ecclesia. Saint Paul uses it many times, the ecclesia. Okay. The gathering. So it's a gathering, so we needed a big building that emphasizes the inside, not the outside. So you'll you'll go and you'll go see some ancient basilicas. You can see some ancient basilicas in uh, Ravenna, as I've already named, or the the Great Catholicon on Mount Sinai, the of the Transfiguration, are some of the Constantinian basilicas in Rome, and the outside is undistinguished. It's very simple. It's very plain. And you go on the inside, and you're you're overwhelmed. Hagia Sophia is the same way. On the outside, it's just a big pile of a building, but on the inside, it's just Breathtaking. It's breathtaking. See, and this is an image of the life of the soul, right? What matters is not the outside. What matters is the inside. I think I've told some of you the story when I was a, a priest in Denver, and our our deacon lived next door to the church with his wife. And uh, one day, the wife, I think she was doing some cleaning in the church. The deacon's wife was cleaning the church, and a lady walked in. A neighbor walked in and said, "Can I come in?" She said, well, "Sure, come in." She said. She said, I'm in your neighbor, and I've walked by this church many times. I've never, uh, the door wasn't open during the week, and I didn't come in. And she looked around. And she said, you know, she said, I've been by this church many times. And I thought it was so small, but I realized it's bigger on the inside than the outside. That's just her instinctive response. It's bigger on the inside than the outside. So another character, besides domesticity, another characteristic of, of uh, Orthodox architecture is interiority. Now, later on, we're going to see, besides the classical basilica form, the rectangle, which became uh, the cross form, or the transepts and the apse, the cross form. Uh, there's also the, the octagonal or circular form, made most famous by Hagia Sophia. Right? And that form, there was uh, uh, an essay in that form in Ravenna, San Vitale, uh, right before, during the reign of Justinian, but before, it was his practice, run up to Hagia Sophia. And the, the round form, a dome form, is based on mausolea, on the tombs, uh, the round mausoleum form. Um, but both emphasize interiority. Both emphasize what's done on the inside, not, not what goes on on the outside. So what we see in the course of the 5th and 6th centuries is a transition from what can be called late antique art, the art of the ancient pagan world in its later stages, right, to early Byzantine art. One microcosm that illustrates this transition beautifully and accurately is a collection of sacred buildings in the northeastern Italian city of Ravenna. Why Ravenna? Ravenna was the capital of the Western Empire in its last days before it was conquered, before Italy was conquered by the uh, Ostrogoths. So they actually moved, they actually moved, and then Justinian reconquered Italy, and he moved the exarchate of the empire. Remember, the emperor is in Constantinople. And he establishes an exarchate in Ravenna, which is in northeastern Italy. And it's a very, it was a very defensible position because it was uh, surrounded by, it was on the sea and surrounded by swamps. It was actually, uh, uh, the nearby port of Classe was, the, was a, a great Roman naval base. And so Ravenna, Justinian, uh, pr ordered uh, several buildings built there. And even prior to Justinian, the, ro the um, the late Western emperors and then the Byzantine exarchs had built beautiful church buildings there in the in the fifth and in the sixth centuries, and they're still there. They're still, some of the greatest examples of Byzantine art are actually in Italy. They're actually just as uh, some of the greatest examples of pagan Greek art are in Sicily. Like it's all part of that Byzantine world. Right? And uh, of course, another example of the Byzantine art of the time of Justinian is the the church in Mount Sinai at St. Catherine's in Mount Sinai. And of course, there's the example of the of the Sinai icon of Christ. There are actually several icons at Mount Sinai from dating from the sixth century. One of the Holy Virgin, one of Christ, the most famous examples. And there's one of Saint Peter. So what's taking place here is that the church took the most spiritual forms of the late antique art, the ones that are most adaptable, right? and they refined them into something completely Christian, which today today we call it Byzantine art. But remember, Byzantine's a very late. Byzantine was invented, a word invented by Western scholars. These people call themselves Romans. When they were, even they were speaking Greek. So what are you? Well, I'm an Orthodox Christian. Oh, but what is your nationality? Oh, I'm uh, Romeos. I'm a Roman. See? 
So they didn't call themselves Byzantines. That's a, that's a later term invented by, by Western scholars. But what we call Byzantine art is really the, the paradigmatic Christian art. Because if we look at the Western art of the Orthodox period, the Western art of the Orthodox Western Church before the separation, whether it's uh, Carolingian art or Ottonian art, for example, they're all derivative from Byzantine art. Yeah. There, there, there are some examples of purely native Western Christian art. For example, the, the Irish, the art of Irish, uh, the Irish, which the most famous example is a manuscript called the Book of Kells, which if you ever go, if you ever, uh, I know some people like to vacation Ireland. If you ever go to Ireland, go to Dublin, go to Trinity College, which is an Anglican college, and ask to see the Book of Kells. It's wild. It's just, it's an amazing uh, use of geometric forms and um, to create fantastic figures of, of men and beasts and so forth. You can see their, their old pagan Irish spirit just coming out. It's, 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 it fits right into the, their, their world of their fairy tales and their leprechauns and so forth. But it, it's very beautiful and it's, it's actually, and they, they Christianized it. It's actually quite Christian. But the mainstream of Western Christian art is certainly derivative from Byzantine art. Certainly depended on Byzantine art. Okay, so what are the characteristics? I know it's getting late, and I'll, I'll try to finish soon. What are the characteristics of this genuine Christian sacred art? Recall from our first class about the early church, we described her character as eschatological, that is oriented to the end of the world, right? otherworldly, oriented to the kingdom of heaven, the next world, the other world, martyric, right? witnessing to the faith, and ascetical, right? denying the flesh, or bringing our body under control, bringing our senses and our thoughts and everything under control. So the insights we discussed in our later two classes regarding the church's true spiritual school, spiritual life, and true theological method lead us in the same direction, to conclude that a genuine sacred art must lead the believer into purification of the senses, cleansing from the passions, and pure prayer in this life, and thus to the heavenly kingdom in the next life, which kingdom he will already have experienced in this life through the holy mysteries, through prayer. Right? So all our art, just like our, 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 our hymns and our theology and our lives of saints and everything that we do in orthodoxy, our art is anagogical. Its purpose is to lead us up, not to celebrate worldly realities, right? but to lead us up, to lead the soul upwards to the union with God. Now, in the process, it does transfigure and it does rejoice in created things. There's a great rejoicing, and orthodox art is the, actually the most splendid uh, beautification of created things. But, the, but that's a byproduct. The purpose is not to celebrate created things. The purpose is to lead the soul to God. This anagogical function necessitates that the true sacred art has to be hierarchical and hieratic. Okay? Hierarchical, of course, means a, a system of highest to lowest, relationships, right? Yeah. And hieratic is from the word for priest. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's organized according to relationships of higher and lower, and it's priestly. The forms and images here below are part of a great hierarchy of forms which extend downward from the heavenly archetypes to their earthly representations, as spoken of here by St. Dionysius in our first quote at the very beginning, talking about how the sensible images lead us up to divine knowledge. Okay. This art is also hieratic. It's priestly. What's the role of a priest? A priest takes material things and through prayer and God's blessing it sanctifies the thing and the thing, it's elevated. It goes from being an earthly thing to a sacred thing and then in turn it comes back and it sanctifies us. It makes us holy and then become, we're, we become holy and we can offer ourselves back to God. That's what, the, that's, the, that's what the art does. So the, the art has a priestly function to offer to the believer the mystery and then to transform the believer so he can offer himself as a mystery, as a spiritual sacrifice, back to God who himself sacrificed his son for us. So that the techniques of this art in all of its media, whether it's visual, auditory, whatever it may be, it has to produce a certain transparency, going back to that word transparency, but the function of this art is not to call attention to itself, but to lead up beyond itself to that which is truly real. 
It's an art that's also anonymous because the artist is working as a member of a community, not on his own. That's why traditionally icons are not signed. There is a recent custom, especially in Greece, where they'll put by the hand of so-and-so. But that's really not, that's a modern practice. Really, traditionally, icons are simply not signed, right? Because the, it's not, it's, it, the point is not to celebrate the artist or his or her creativity. Although they, they are creative people, they are creating, right? They, there's this, a profound creativity. But that's not, they're, they're working as an as a inheritor of a tradition and as a member of a community. And because the artist is performing this work as an act of worship. So next week we're going to look at actual examples to illustrate these themes of anagogy, hierarchy, hieraticism, transparency, and anonymity. Okay. To form a clear picture of this fully developed art. Of course, it, it's funny to sit here for an hour and talk about art and not even to look at any art. So we're going to look at it. We're going to, we're going to look at it next week.